the months following the fire, they claimed the crazy hotel and leveled a full city block. The remaining hotels and resorts and mineral wells did their best to pick up the slack, but they only had so much capacity, and even the best of them couldn't hold a candle to the world-class amenities that had drawn so many guests to the crazy hotel over the years. If Mineral Wells was going to hang on to its status as Texas's premier water destination, they had to do something, and fast. As local leaders mulled their options, a man named Carr P. Collins happened to come through town for a quick spa getaway. Carr was an insurance executive from Dallas with a keen eye for investment opportunities that he and his brother Hal might want to get in on. Carr was a deliberate, austere kind of guy when it came to numbers, and he liked to keep a tight hold on his wallet till he was sure everything added up just right. Hal, on the other hand, was a boisterous, loudmouth salesman who owned several car dealerships in Dallas and had a penchant for dipping his wingtip Oxfords into local politics. On any other day, Hal would have been the one making a lively pitch for a venture this big, risky, and, well, crazy. But when Carr drove past the charred foundation of the crazy hotel, he saw a glimmer of opportunity there among the ruins, and his gut told him that glimmer was solid gold. Hello, you got Hal Collins on the line. Hello, Hal. You've got yourself $35,000 worth of stock in the new crazy hotel over in Mineral Wells. <laughs> that's just great. Now where am I going to get $35,000? Well, that's the $35,000 I owe you. <laughs> you don't say. The Collins brothers purchased the land, the well, and the crazy water company itself, and soon broke ground on the new and improved crazy hotel. Their grand vision wasn't a replica or restoration, but something bigger and better than the town, Texas, and maybe the world had ever seen. But the townsfolk didn't exactly share their enthusiasm. Nobody doubted that the brothers' reimagining of the landmark would be a badly needed boon to the local economy, or that it would be the marvel of engineering and amenity as the brothers claimed it would. It's just that the original Crazy Hotel had been a community investment, funded, managed, and operated by the people of Mineral Wells for the benefit of the town as a whole. There was just something off-putting, offensive even, about a couple of big city big shots with a daddy in the Texas Senate turning the ashes of their town's collective project into their own personal cash cow. So a group of civic leaders, business owners, and local investors pooled their resources to build a hotel of their own, one that would be twice as good as anything a couple of silver spoon-fed Dallas boys could ever dream up. And more importantly, one that would keep all the profits where they belonged, right there in Mineral Wells. So they drew up a proposition and dropped a line to a man down in San Antonio by the name of T.B. Baker. Theodore Brasher Baker was a self-made man who'd worked his way up from the night audit clerk at a hotel in Kansas to the owner of multiple luxury hotels throughout the Midwest. He first came to Texas in 1914 on a business trip, and just as soon as he'd set foot in the lobby of the St. Anthony Hotel in San Antonio, he was smitten. Within a year, he'd sold his hotel in Illinois and bought the St. Anthony. But Baker wasn't content just to own the place. He had to make it his own. It'd become something of a habit for him, part compulsion, part branding. But his heavy personal involvement in the renovations helped make the already successful hotel into a world-class destination. And in Texas, he was just getting started. He acquired the Menger Hotel only a few months later, a place famous for being a favorite haunt of Teddy Roosevelt during the Spanish-American War. The future president was a staple at the Menger Bar, slamming whiskey and chatting up the Texan rabble-rousers, rangers, and other weirdos for potential recruits to his legendary regiment, the Rough Riders. Baker would build his first hotel from the ground up in 1921, the Texas Hotel in downtown Fort Worth. Two years later, he built the Stephen F. Austin Hotel in, well, Austin. A year after that, he bought the Gunter Hotel in downtown San Antonio which cemented himself and his wife May as one of the most prominent and influential power couples in the city, if not the whole state. Baker's brand was prestige, and he insisted on providing the most cutting-edge amenities available anywhere in the world, like laundering facilities, in-room ice water, on-site childcare, and way more. While tweaking his overhaul of the Gunter, he even commissioned a lumber yard to build a full-scale working model of the hotel's lobby made of scrap lumber and cheesecloth, so he'd be able to literally walk through the space and rearrange the columns, doors, and walls to his finicky liking. And all that perfectionism paid off. Every hotel he touched became a smashing success and a magnet for the rich, famous, and powerful from all over the world. Baker was on track to become America's most renowned hotelier, rivaled only by fellow Texan and hospitality magnate Conrad Hilton, who, by the way, had just opened his first eponymous hotel on Main Street in downtown Dallas. 
When it came to hotels, T.B. Baker was the elite of the elite. And yet, in mid-1925, a small town in nowhere North Texas, founded and run on magical water, somehow managed to get him on the line. The committee had only managed to scrape together a $150,000 offer, a paltry fraction of the budget they had for the original crazy hotel, and peanuts to a man of Baker's stature. But something about the project just clicked with him, and to their surprise, he said yes. Carr and Hal Collins' crazy hotel opened two years later in 1927, and though it wasn't quite as groundbreaking as they might have envisioned, it was pretty damn close. The building was seven stories tall and featured 200 guest rooms, storefronts, a barber shop, a doctor's office, florist, bookstore, rec room, rooftop garden, and a lobby that was big enough for bands and orchestras to play inside. And, of course, all four strengths of Crazy Water. Meanwhile, Baker and the town's investors were drawing up plans for a hotel that would be twice as tall and have more than twice as many rooms. But they kinda undershot the budgeting. The Baker Hotel's construction would take three years to complete and eventually cost upwards of $1.7 million. And that's mostly because, true to form, Baker spared no expense and obsessed over every detail. He tapped an architect he'd worked with back in Austin, Wyatt Hedrick, famous for designing iconic Texas buildings like the Will Rogers Memorial Center, TMP train station, Texas Tech University buildings, and many more. With drafting underway, Baker took a trip out to California where he visited a hotel that had its own swimming pool right there on the grounds. He'd never seen anything like it. So naturally, he decided his new hotel had to have one too. Bigger and better, of course. He had Hedrick add an Olympic-sized pool filled with mineral water. It would be the first hotel swimming pool ever built in Texas and one of the first in the entire country. He also installed air conditioning, key-controlled lights in every room, one of the world's first drive through check-in desks, and an underground tunnel to the garage for the safekeeping of the guests' fancy cars. Baker made sure his new hotel would have all the same world-class amenities they were offering guests over at the Crazy, and then up the ante with a fully equipped gym, a library, a bowling alley, and even a golf course. That October, the San Antonio Daily Express ran a full-page article calling T.B. Baker, quote, the most prominent hotel man in the South. And at the time, even Conrad Hilton would have had to concede that it was true. And not just because the brand new Baker Hotel in Dallas was mere blocks away from his flagship property and was already siphoning away his high-end customer base. Baker opened five hotels in 1929 alone, all within just six months, the fifth and final of which was the Baker Hotel in Mineral Wells. It was the first and only resort he ever owned, and it would be the last hotel he would ever build. In the last weeks of October, 1929, the stock market crashed. Panic swept through Wall Street and across the country, but in Mineral Wells, it felt like nothing more than a newspaper headline. Everyone in town was gearing up for the grand opening gala of the majestic new Baker Hotel, and the doors finally opened on November 22nd, 1929, and the wealthy elites, still unfazed by the growing economic devastation around them, paraded up the front steps to the triumphant tunes of a big band orchestra. It's important to remember that the Great Depression wasn't something that happened all at once. It was a gradual process, and the full gravity of the situation wouldn't meaningfully set in for the majority of Americans for another couple of years. The swanky trend of mineral water spas was still the cat's pajamas among those who never saw or couldn't care less about the droughts and plights of the soon-to-be-labeled flyover states. The town's social life revolved around the Baker following its opening, Fowler wrote. Being at the Baker meant you were part of the in-crowd in Mineral Wells. And while the VIP guests at the resorts were still blissfully insulated from the financial collapse, the hotel industry was quickly getting crushed beneath it, and luxury water resorts were no exception. Carr and Howe's crazy hotel had only been in operation for two years at that point, and it was already on the brink of collapse. The pavilion bar stools were gathering dust, and mineral water wasn't exactly a priority purchase for working-class locals who suddenly found themselves struggling to put food on the table. The train cars rolling into town brought in more empty seats than tourists, and it was only getting worse as the depression deepened and dragged on. If the locals weren't buying and the tourists weren't coming, they needed a way to tap into new markets outside of town. They could bottle the water, advertise it, ship it, get it out to the world, but even with all the empty trains and a freight industry starving for business, shipping crates of heavy glass bottles was still way too expensive to be a viable option. Fortunately, Hal wrote, our largest stockholder, my brother, Car P. Collins, is a man of vision. The brothers met at the crazy and, as Hal put it, quote, The solution materialized as dramatically as the vision of an Old Testament prophet. Just then, we heard a French harp down beneath us in the pavilion. This sounded real good. 
What if there were a way to ship crazy water without the water? The solution, it seems, had been right there in front of them all along in a bright green box full of crystals. The Crazy Water Company and about a dozen others had been selling boxes of crystallized powder residue made from the evaporated mineral water for nearly 40 years at that point, but none of them had ever made much of an effort to push the stuff. After all, it wasn't exactly flying off the shelves when the real deal water was right there on tap, but the crystals in the packaging were cheap to make, lightweight enough to ship in bulk, and easy to advertise. Now you can enjoy all the benefits of authentic, world-famous, and bona fide Mineral Wells Healing Mineral Water from the comfort of your own home. Look for the bright green box of crazy crystals and just add water. It seemed like a damn good plan, and maybe the only plan, but the brothers still had to tighten their belts just the same as anyone else, and the best chance to save their company might be a little cooperation with the competition. We decided we were nuts to Buck Baker, Hal wrote. So we made an appointment with him, and our suggestion was that our two companies could divide the business, with his taking the hotel profits and ours taking the product profits. So they sat down with their arch rival and laid out the pitch for what seemed like a win-win partnership. But according to Hal, Baker sat there listening politely till they finished their spiel, then simply said, mm, No, and walked out of the room. It may very well have been the worst business decision of his life. We bristled like Havilene hogs, Hal wrote. So we went out and got rich. He went broke. The Collins brothers decided to move forward without him, but with the specter of bankruptcy looming, their pivot to the crystal market needed to happen fast, and it needed to be big. Sure, they could take out ads in newspapers across the country, but that wasn't cheap, and it could take months for the sales to start trickling in. But then, Car P. Collins, once again, had himself a big idea. All right, what if, now hear me out, we do advertisements, but on the radio? It was a novel idea, to put it mildly. Public radio stations and broadcasts had only existed for about 10 years at that point, but it was fast becoming the hot new must-have tech. In 1921, there were only five radio stations in the entire country. Eight years later, there were nearly 600. About half of all American households owned a radio, and unlike just about everything else, it was depression-proof. It didn't cost anything to tune in, making it the cheapest form of entertainment around, and for a lot of folks, the only one they could still afford, which meant it had a built-in and captive audience. So in February of 1930, Hal jumped into his Model A Ford with a friend of his, a local country singer named Dick Ware, and drove out to the KRLD radio station in Dallas for 15 minutes of airtime. Dick would start out playing, and after that, I'd preach, Hal wrote. And I don't mean I gave commercials, no. I preached. Almost before we got back to Mineral Wells, that money was already piled up on Carr's desk. The commercials, or sermons, were a huge hit with the station's audience, and soon Dick and Hal were doing a new broadcast every Sunday night. Did you ever think about how absolutely necessary water is to keep you alive? A man can live without food for maybe 40, 60, even 80 days, but you deprive him of water for five or six days, he'll die. A horrible death. Your body itself's about four-fifths water. You know the kind Providence has done lots of wonderful things and she gave us pure water. That is one of the most wonderful things she ever gave us. In a natural crazy of mineral water, kind Providence has gone a lot further and blended precious minerals in the right proportions to help people out in the world who are troubled by some condition that was caused or being made worse by a sluggish system. By 1931, there were 21 companies in mineral wells hawking their own brand of crystals. But thanks to Hal's radio preaching, the name folks knew and remembered was crazy. One of those folks was a fledgling musician from Fort Worth by the name of Bob Wills. Like so many other Americans, he was struggling to find work, but the popularity of Hal's broadcasts gave him an idea. Wills arranged a meeting with the head of Burroughs Mills Flower Company and pitched him the idea of putting together a band to promote their products on the radio. The company's president, a flamboyant fella named W. Lee Papio Daniel, happened to be something of a songwriter himself, though he wasn't personally a fan of, quote, that hillbilly music. But if it's working this good for them hicks out there in crazy town, well, why the hell not? So he and Wills formed a band called the Light Crust Doughboys to pick and grin up some flower business out there in Radio Land. As a boss, Pappy was a petty tyrant, and he was just kind of a dick in general. As part of their contract, he required Wills and the Doughboys to work grueling shifts at the flour mill between the radio spots if they wanted to get paid. 
But when the broadcast proved to be a hit within a span of only a few weeks, Pappy built an on-site studio and put the boys to work on music full time. The Collins brothers, meanwhile, were giving their own studio an upgrade, relocating the engineering crew and the entire studio to the crazy hotel lobby where they could host their own daily broadcasts without having to pay for the airtime. The new setup allowed the hotel guests to watch the show live in production as it was broadcast statewide over the Texas Quality Network. Hal even invited the occasional audience member up to the mic to read wildly exaggerated testimonials praising crazy crystals on the air. And Carr, never one to pass up an opportunity when he saw one, soon tapped Pappy O'Daniel, Bob Wills, and the Light Crust Doughboys to join the Crazy Crystals radio team. In June 1932, the company launched a paid program on NBC Radio, making Crazy Crystals the first ever Texas product to be advertised on a national network. And according to a few sources we found, the show was the first regular commercial broadcast ever aired on the NBC network. As long as the money kept rolling in, Pappy lightened up a bit, and even joined in on the show as the official MC. He was a natural at the new gig, and it eventually led him to his true calling as a red-faced shock jock of a politician, but we'll get to that in a minute. For now, he was busy hamming it up in recurring ad spots, earning him statewide fame as Pass the Biscuits Pappy. He's also the inspiration for the character in the movie Oh Brother Where Art Thou, who shares his name. It's not a perfectly accurate portrayal of the real-life Pappy, and this sure as hell ain't Mississippi but it's not all that inaccurate either. Pappy's relationship with Bob Wills had begun to sour though, mostly on account of Wills' habitual tardiness and even more habitual drinking, and Pappy soon fired him from the band. It didn't work out too bad for Wills though. He rebounded quickly and went on to become a Texas music legend. Shortly after firing Wills, Pappy himself got the boot from his job as president of the flower company. So he started his own called Hillbilly Flower and started a new band, the Hillbilly Boys. Guess he warmed up to that hillbilly music after all. Or maybe it was just the massive influx of cash in the middle of a depression. Who can say? Besides, he wasn't the only one. The Collins brothers were convinced that when it came to making good radio in Texas, there was, quote, no such thing as two country. They leaned into it pretty hard, churning out copy for how to read on air, like, quote, When I was a kid, I used to have a shotgun. And when that shotgun got clogged up, I used to take a ramrod and I'd give it a good cleaning. Now, Crazy Water does the same for you. When you get all clogged up, Crazy Water just like a ramrod. But some of the other on-air talent started to think they were taking the hillbilly thing a little too far and worried it might alienate them from a wider audience. They pressured the company to hire some more professional writers and MCs. But after a few days of the new toned down approach, the switchboards were lighting up in a dang fury. One caller said, quote, What happened to that fellow with the shotgun? He's the best thing on the whole show. And hey, like they say, you gotta give the people what they want. From then on, Crazy Crystal's radio was nothing but a down home redneck review. Carr would later say, quote, My programming in the 30s and 40s gave folks the stuff the big networks neglected. And he was right. It's hard to get across just how popular the radio infomercials of Mineral Wells were at that time. This was like the Game of Thrones of Depression-era Texas radio. As Fowler put it, quote, Hal Collins was one of the first marketers in the country to truly take advantage of the radio's potential for advertising. He knew that in order to sell a product, it had to connect with people emotionally. Hal knew that most people were looking for a diversion when they turned on the radios, music, stories, and reminders of better times. The old hillbilly folk song, Shouts and Announcements, seemed to capture the enthusiastic, knee-slapping gusto of those old-fashioned country revivals. Pappy and the Collins brothers assembled a comedy troupe they called The Crazy Gang Show, which was kind of a variety show featuring comedians, famous musicians, trivia, hog callers, and one of radio's first ever call-in Q&As. According to historian Tom Peeler, they once posed the question, Can an Indian become president? And they received close to 9,000 replies. We also need to mention that they aired their fair share of live minstrel shows, and blackface on the radio is an especially weird flavor of racism. The infomercials were such a lucrative success that the Collins brothers started opening satellite offices all over the country, some of which even launched their own regional versions of the show. They even bought a Mexican radio station to broadcast the craziness south of the border. The show was so popular and became so widespread that while we were researching this miniseries, we were finding references to the bright green box of crystals in places as far flung as North Carolina. But while the Collins brothers and their crazy crystals radio were blowing up all over America, the Baker Hotel was struggling to keep its head above water. 
the hotel filed for bankruptcy in 1932, and once again, T.B. Baker found himself sitting across the table from Hal and Carr Collins, and this time, he was a whole lot more amenable to what they had to say. The meeting culminated in a citywide partnership between the private and public sectors to go all in on what they collectively did best, advertising. They scrounged up nearly a million dollars to fund a massive ad campaign, and the whole town came together to cook up the perfect slogan, Mineral Wells, where America drinks its way to health. Now, that might seem a little meh by today's standards, but in the Depression era, that shit slaps. As Fowler describes it, quote, In the 1930s, these words were drilled as thoroughly into the American subconscious as were later such phrases as, A little dabble do ya, have it your way, and it's the real thing. That ad campaign, coupled with the crazy hotel's radio magic, almost single-handedly kept the hotels and the town itself alive and thriving as it weathered the worst decade of economic hardship in American history. Well, as of this recording, anyway. Hal and Carr were selling as much as $3 million in crystals alone every year, making the Crazy Water Company Mineral Wells' largest employer throughout the Depression. And it's probably worth mentioning that they were selling those bright green boxes for only a dollar a pop. But the astronomical success of the mail-order crystal business had an unfortunate and ironic side effect. If people could cheaply and easily make their own miracle water at home, it didn't exactly leave much of an incentive for folks to travel all the way out to Mineral Wells. The Collins brothers may have found their ticket out of financial ruin and into fabulous prosperity in spite of all those empty seats coming in on the train cars. But in doing so, they'd unwittingly ensured that those seats were never filled again. For folks lounging poolside at the Baker, it was like the Roaring Twenties had never ended. But beneath the surface, a deep Dickensian divide was forming between the depression-ravaged locals and the millionaire celebrities who still had the money to travel out to nothing nowhere just to take the waters. In the words of historian Cameron Gwynn, the situation, quote, created a local euphoria recalled by many with mixed emotions. At a time when some families were living in dugouts within the city limits, the big bands on the roof gardens of the Baker and Crazy Hotels were sending beautiful sounds across the summer nights. But this tale of two crazies was mostly invisible, or at least ignorable, to the ridiculously long list of celebrities that were stopping into town for a taste of trendy luxury. Seriously, we made a list of every celebrity visitor that we could find a record of, and even after we cut it down to only the names that we recognized as the uncultured 30-somethings we are, it was still over a page long. Helen Keller, Pat Boone, Will Rogers, D.W. Griffith, Judy Garland, The Three Stooges, Clark Gable, Roy Rogers, J.P. Morgan, Lyndon B. Johnson, Ronald Reagan, and that's just to name a very few. And if you believe the gossip, even the infamous criminals Machine Gun Kelly and Bonnie and Clyde dropped in for a few hands of underground poker every now and then. Lawrence Welk once told an interviewer, quote, I remember the Baker is one of the more lavish hotels in Texas, a famed resort, lots of rich ladies. The staff kept a Rolls Royce in the underground garage for any celebrity who was too classy to walk a few blocks around town. 1933 was arguably the year the Great Depression became an unavoidable and terrifying part of everyday American reality. But for guests at the Baker and the Crazy Spas, all that devastation and suffering might as well have been worlds away. And it was that very same year that Hal and Carr Collins commissioned the construction of a big electric sign over the main downtown intersection, mostly as a marketing ploy, but also as a thank you gift to the community. Welcome to Mineral Wells, it read, the home of crazy. While the water companies might have felt insulated to some extent from the depression, they weren't immune to the seismic shift in the nation's government. The Federal Trade Commission was filing lawsuits all over the place, accusing mineral water companies of making fraudulent claims about the water's medicinal properties, which they undeniably were doing. But we feel compelled to mention that Hal Collins was a vocal and well-publicized opponent of FDR's New Deal policies, and a handful of sources we found proffered the theory that his speeches may have made the town a much more visible target for federal regulation. We couldn't verify that in any conclusive way, but it's worth mentioning and it's certainly not beyond the realm of possibility. Legislation was proposed in the U.S. Senate to close some of the glaring loopholes in the regulations, prompting Ruxford Tugwell, a left-wing activist and influential member of FDR's Brain Trust, to put together an exhibit that might gin up support for the bill. The result was a showcase of allegedly dangerous and deceptive products and advertising presented in a weird amalgamation of museum tour, political propaganda, and carnival spook house. The Chamber of Horrors, as it was called, was such a hit, the Department of Agriculture decided to move it to the 1933 Century of Progress Exposition in Chicago, 
where Car P. Collins just happened to be in town for a visit. While strolling through the various exhibits, a familiar bright green box caught his eye. Carr was shocked and enraged that anyone would dare put crazy crystals in such a vile display, and he quote, strode briskly to the nearest telephone, where he called up both of Texas's senators for a stern talking to. As politicians, especially Texan politicians, are wont to do, they immediately caved to the businessman's demands, apologized profusely, and offered up a toothless compromise. They'd pull some strings and call in some favors to banish the crystals from the Chamber of Horrors, if Carr would only be so gracious and kind as to slap a few more warnings and disclaimers on his labels. But by that point, the damage was already done. Thousands of people had come through the exhibit, and word was already getting around that mineral water crystals were ineffective at best and at worst, poison. Meanwhile, in Congress, Representative Thomas Blanton of Abilene spoke out in opposition to the legislation, saying, quote, Mr. Speaker, I object to any of Mr. Tugwell's philosophy going in the record. In my opinion, his so-called Tugwell bill would have closed up every country drugstore in the United States and would have put out of business every country newspaper. He did a great injustice to a high-class, highly respected mineral water business in my district at Mineral Wells, Texas, which had been curing afflicted people from all over the United States for nearly a hundred years. He had this product in his Chamber of Horrors at Chicago until we forced him to take it out. I do not like his philosophy. The influential Dallas magazine Hollins, founded by a frequent patron of mineral water spas, published an editorial proclaiming that the bill would, quote, deprive the public of the right of self-medication, as well as force medicine into politics, raise the cost of care, create a dangerous black market, and, quote, usurp American liberty to an extent never before even attempted. For the record, we should note that Carr Collins also bought Hollins magazine just a few years later. It's also important to remember that at the time, selling drugs and alcohol as, quote, feel-good remedies packaged as patent medicines was standard practice. Even goat gland transplants to, quote, restore to males their romantic urges was a thing that actually happened somehow. Where did they put the glands? N never mind. The point is, the industry had operated for decades with a more or less buyer knows best, hands off kind of attitude, and the shifting culture really wasn't shifting enough to shift business standards along with it. Adopting a more modern, buyer beware attitude was pretty much as far as the companies were willing to go, and they had a lot of help from high profile politicians who had pretty obvious incentives for turning a blind eye to any flim flam. Like we said earlier, most water towns were in far-flung rural areas that didn't exactly have a whole lot more to offer at the time. As far as elected officials were concerned, Magical Water was big business in their districts, if not the biggest, and their constituents, on the whole, were in no rush to see the industry reined in. It was an era of reform, for sure, and the political cloud of water town districts was waning as the times moved on without them. But like we still know way too well today, if you know the right people and you have the right amount of money, there's no law you can't bend till it breaks. So for now, the water and the money kept flowing. But at that point, the water towns of Texas were only thriving on borrowed time. For T.B. Baker, it was the breaking point. His company's financial situation had gone from bad to bankruptcy to worse, compelling him to sell off a majority of his hotels, break up the corporation, and divvy up what was left between his two nephews. His sister, Myla, no longer able to afford a place of her own, took up permanent residence at the Baker Hotel, while TB and his wife, May, returned to their apartment at the Gunter Hotel and disappeared completely from the public eye and the historical record for the next 30 years. Pappy O'Daniel, meanwhile, was riding his radio stardom all the way to the Texas governor's mansion. As the Democratic nominee, the planks of his platform were an odd mix. On the one hand, he advocated for the abolition of the death penalty and the poll tax, and advocated for the establishment of old age pensions. But on the other hand, he was trumpeting the Ten Commandments, finagling sweetheart deals for his hillbilly flower company, cutting taxes for his rich pals, and letting industry ride roughshod over the agricultural interest of his so-called base. Pappy was a well-educated, middle-class businessman with a lifelong disdain for the people he considered dumb country yokels, but his reputation as the famous hillbilly radio star was strong enough to win him the rural vote in a landslide. Once in office, he reneged on all of his promises, of course, and introduced a tax plan written entirely by manufacturing lobbyists. He attacked organized labor and packed the University of Texas Board of Regents with people who wanted to limit academic freedom and sniff out subversives. 
Hal and Carr Collins were two of his biggest supporters and fundraisers, basically the Koch brothers of the Pass the Biscuits agenda, retooling the radio show into a nonstop barrage of campaign propaganda. Luckily for Texans at the time, Pappy wasn't nearly as good at politicking as he was at hyping biscuits on the old can. As the Handbook of Texas put it, quote, He enjoyed little success in putting across his agenda. He was unable to engage in normal political deal-making with legislators, vetoed bills that he probably did not understand, and was overridden in 12 out of 57 vetoes, a record, but he was largely able to negate his ignorance, his isolation, and his political handicaps with masterful radio showmanship. He had all the best ratings. Everyone says so. As the 1930s drew to a close, business in water towns was on a steady, precipitous decline, not just in mineral wells or even the state, but everywhere. The Crazy Water Company was feeling losses from the well-publicized cease and desist order over their dubious health claims in 1940. Gasoline was under rationing restrictions by the government, and folks just didn't have the discretionary income to waste on things like fancy health spas. But Mineral Wells, like so many things at the time, found its salvation in war. In October 1940, likely with a little political push from the Collins brothers, the US military opened a base in town called Fort Walters, it served as home to the largest infantry replacement training center in World War II, and its presence nearly tripled the population, extending an invaluable lifeline to the struggling hotels and every other business in town. And when the war was over, the soldiers who'd trained at Fort Walters had come to see the hotels and the town itself as a fond memory. And not just on account of the extravagant, wild, celebrity-filled parties and USO shows, this was the place where so many of them had said their most meaningful goodbyes, not just to their family when they shipped out, but to brothers-in-arms who never came back. Their flag-draped coffins were sent elsewhere, home. This wasn't the place for funerals or grief. For the surviving soldiers, Mineral Wells, Texas became the centerpiece for a celebration of life, whether it was a gracious return or a fond farewell. And decade after decade, they would come back, not to mourn, but to remember, to celebrate the lives they came back to and those that were left behind. For an entire generation of soldiers, this strange little nowhere town with the funny signs and magic water would be a place of homecoming. Fort Walters itself had served as a POW camp for German soldiers captured in South Africa during the last years of World War II. But once the war had ended and the prisoners had been shipped home, the base was deactivated Many of the buildings were torn down and large portions of the land were sold off to private businesses. And once more, the hotel lobbies were quiet and the train cars rolled in, filled only with empty seats. The end of the war was the end of an era for mineral wells. Hal and Carr sold the Crazy Hotel in 1947 and sold the mineral rights to a businessman in Dallas who relocated the Crazy Water headquarters to the big city. The Collins brothers washed their hands of Mineral Wells, Texas and walked away millionaires. Carr went into philanthropy, for whatever that's worth, and the Dallas branch of the Salvation Army is still named in his honor. The remaining mineral well companies began to shutter their doors, one after another, until only a tiny handful remained, barely hanging on by a thread. It was the 1950s, and things like penicillin, vaccines, and antibiotics had completely revolutionized the field of medicine. The world was moving on from the era of magic water and leaving the once booming water towns of Texas out to dry. Bizarre alternative medicine trends were just as prevalent as ever, of course, but they, like everything else, were evolving with the times, and were a long way from the days of Ouija boards and crystal balls. It was the summer of 1955, and strange homemade signs were springing up along the roadways all over Comanche County. Uraniatorium, Uranium Dirt House, plenty of parking space, for sale here, original Comanche Chief brand radioactive government tested uranium dirt, it's air conditioned. The signs directed curious motorists out to a small dairy farm in Newburgh, about an hour and a half drive south of Mineral Wells, where a farmer named Jesse Reese waited, likely doing his best to hide the smirk on his face. He'd recently discovered that patches of his land contained trace amounts of uranium, not enough to be harmful, but also not enough to sell. As the Cold War was ramping up, the US government was offering sizable amounts of cash for uranium to add to their stockpiles, and they were actively encouraging civilians to take up uranium hunting as a recreational hobby. It sounds a lot more dangerous than it was, at least as far as we can glean from our cursory skim through Wikipedia, but that's neither here nor there. It was something of an American fad for a while, and there's even an I Love Lucy episode about it. 
But when you've got widespread pop cultural awareness of something new and interesting, and you combine it with the average person's general ignorance of what that thing actually is or does, you've got some fertile ground for the seeds of pseudoscience. And sure enough, so-called hot sod houses and uranium farms popped up all over West Texas and New Mexico in the 1950s, proudly claiming that their irradiated dirt spas could cure anything from hangnails to cancer. The ad copy for uranium treatments could have been lifted straight from a Crazy Crystal's radio script, just with an updated look for the atomic age. So when Jesse Reese got wind that all these ridiculous city folks were willing to pay big bucks just to roll around in some radioactive dirt, he thought, why not? At first it was just kind of an amusing distraction and a few extra bucks on the side, but the people just kept on coming. He even tried jacking up the price, thinking an unreasonable amount might turn people away, but it didn't. People were flooding in every day from all over the state, lining up in their cars for miles down the road. According to Jesse, the visitors numbered between 500 and 5,000, depending on the day. And at $2 a ticket for two hours of dirt sitting, it didn't take long for the revenue to eclipse anything he could make off the dairy farm. So Jesse sold his cows and converted his barn into an amphitheater with a built-in cafe. He started getting national press coverage, including a puffy write-up in the New York Times. And it made Jesse's uranium sitting house so famous that he regularly caught people sneaking onto the property at night just to steal buckets of dirt. The Atomic Energy Commission and the Texas State Health Department both released statements proclaiming that the dirt was worthless, but nobody cared. So-called sitting centers sprang up in Dallas, Houston, and Austin, importing truckloads of dirt from Comanche County and charging luxury premiums to the trendy rubes in Uptown. Hardly a day went by when some big-time business mogul didn't drop in with an offer to buy the land, but Jesse always turned it down. After all, he was literally bringing grocery sacks full of cash to the bank on a daily basis, so why stop now? But as you can probably guess, he really should have taken those offers when he still had the chance. Like any health fad, it was temporary, and compared to miracle water, uranium dirt was just a flash in the pan. The number of curious motorists following his strange homemade signs to the farm peaked and then dwindled until they just stopped coming altogether. Soon, the only folks knocking on Jesse's door were IRS agents looking for their cut of his cash-only success. It was over, just like that. For two short years of his life, Jesse Reese finally got a taste of what it was like to truly live the dream. But in August 1957, he put a gun to his head and put an end to his nightmare. It would be kind of hackneyed if we ended this with a well-worn metaphor about blessings that turned out to be a curse. So we won't do that, because in the case of all these Texan miracle cures, it might not be a metaphor at all. To be continued. Texarkana is written and produced by us, Ryan Sheffield and Brad Dewar. Recorded here in beautiful Denton, Texas. Music by Whiskey Folk Ramblers. Additional music by Less Than One and available at freemusicarchive.org. Sorry about the wait on this one, y'all. It's been a rough couple of weeks. We'll see you next week for part five, the conclusion. And thanks for listening, y'all. Listener.